It's me again. This is so-called enabling legislation. So by way of background, back in 2013, last year, the city council directed that we get going on developing some impact fees. Uh, we engaged several consultants to prepare nexus studies on affordable housing, parks, and transportation impact fees. On April 1st, the council held a study session and directed that the proposed impact fees be referred to various committees and the planning commission for review and comment. And as I'm sure you recall, on April 24th, the Planning Commission held a study session on the proposed impact fees. The City Council will be holding a public hearing on the proposed fees next Tuesday on July 1st, and they're expected to take action on them at their following meeting on July 15th. The Planning Commission's comments that you made at your April 24th study session have been forwarded to the City Council in the July 1st staff report. Um, However, before the council can adopt the new fees, the municipal code needs to be amended to establish regulations and procedures for them, so-called enabling legislation. Staff, therefore, proposes to amend the planning regulations to modify Article 4 of Chapter 5, the Affordable Housing Set-Aside Program, and rename it the Affordable Housing Program for the Affordable Housing Impact Fee and add a new Article 19 to Chapter 5 called Development Impact Fees for the Parks and Transportation Impact Fees and possibly for other impact fees in the future. Any amendments to the planning regulations require the Planning Commission to review them and make a recommendation to the City Council. Uh, so that is what's before you tonight. The fees themselves are not before the Commission tonight. Just want to make that clear. You're not opining or voting on any fees tonight just on this enabling legislation. So just to summarize what these, uh, um, it'll be two ordinances going to the city council, one to amend article four and the other to add article 19. And just to summarize what those are, the uh, article four, chapter five, affordable housing program, the title is changed from affordable housing set aside program to affordable <laughs> housing <laughs> program. And the same change is made throughout the article except spell correctly. <laughs> Uh, the unit threshold where this fee would kick in is lowered from 30 units to uh, 30 units or more to 10 units or more. Um, the article uh, provides the authority and process for the city to establish and collect fees on rental, residential, and non-residential development projects. It also offers an alternative compliance procedure for developers to provide affordable housing either on-site or off-site through the dedication of land or through other means instead of paying the fee. That has to come to the Planning Commission for approval. You have to find that it will result in uh, at least as much, if not more, housing at the same or deeper affordability levels as paying the fee would result in. Um, it creates an affordable housing fund into which the fee would be deposited. And it specifies that the uh, use of the funds shall be uh, for the provision of affordable housing. Charlie, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, on the, the resolution itself, uh, paragraph two and paragraph four, under the unit threshold, um, it says it doesn't lower the unit. So is, it's, it says uh, the, the housing element policy to ensure inclusion of below market rate units in residential projects of 30 or more units. But wouldn't it be 10? So I'm just, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding what's going on here or if that's a typo. What page? Uh, this is page three of the actual resolution, sec, uh, well, third paragraph, housing element policy 2A4. Uh, oh. Is that? Yeah, okay. that's a good catch. I think we modified. Well, what is H2? And then also the, the one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph, H2-1-2, would that also be changed to 10? I just wasn't sure if. Yeah, it looks like you're right. Wait a minute. H2-1-2. H2. Yeah, you know, I think this was written before that change was made to the housing element. It actually just says H212 now says 
continue to implement the affordable housing set aside ordinance uh -oh. which is well that's what it's currently <laughs> just called just the adorable housing program to now. require the inclusion <laughs> of below market <laughs> units in residential <laughs> projects and dope. consider reducing yeah. the unit threshold to make the ordinance applicable to smaller projects that's what it says now so that needs to be changed we should probably change change this uh, 30 Mm -hmm. I think that's what it previously so, yeah, said. So, yeah, so 2A4 and H212. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good catch. And I don't know if now is the appropriate time to discuss that in further thing, or should we let you finish and ask our questions? Uh, I'd appreciate it if you let me okay. just get through this. It won't take very long. Um, so that's that's affordable housing. Then the other one is the new Article 19 development impact fees. This establishes the authority for development impact fees and specifies the fees are to be used to mitigate the impacts of development projects uh, have on the city's ability to provide public facilities. It specifies that the public facilities to be provided uh, will be categorized into separate types, including but not limited to transportation, parks, and recreation, and there can be more added in the future. Uh, it specifies that the type and amount of each fee will be approved by the city council by resolution and supported by a technical report that identifies the purpose and maximum amount of the fee and establishing the nexus between the fee and development projects on which it's imposed. In other words, the so-called nexus studies. Um, generally, payment of the fee will be due at issuance of a building permit. However, it can be deferred until final inspection or certificate of occupancy, but if the uh, developer elects to do that, they will be required to pay whatever fee is in effect at that time. And if the fee goes up, then they will have to pay the higher fee in exchange for waiting till later to pay it. By state law, however, that is not applicable to residential projects. We have to keep the fee constant for a residential project. And the city may adjust each type of fee from time to time to reflect updated information about costs of projects that are funded by the fee. Exemptions from impact fees are provided for residential remodeling projects and any other project for which the applicant can demonstrate that there is a basis in local, state, or federal law for such an exemption. Uh, does that include uh, condominiums then? Because it Previously, you said residential rental projects. Well, there's no fee on uh, condominiums anyway, right? The, the fee would only apply to residential rental projects. So, and it would not apply to a remodeling of a residential rental project. It would not apply to a condominium in any case. Because they already are required to put in affordable housing? Yes, that's right. They're not exempt from the affordable housing program. Um, this is the other. This is the other fees. So this is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. You're right. I'm get, I'm mixing apples and oranges here. Yeah, the other fees, the traffic impact fee, the park fee, would not apply to residential remodel projects, any kind, rental or home ownership. Refunds of impact fees for projects that are abandoned after the fee is paid can be made under certain circumstances that are specified in the ordinance. Uh, credits, this is a big one, this is important to uh, developers. An applicant may apply to the city council for a fee credit in return for providing a specified public facility that is to be otherwise funded by the fee. However, that would not apply if a developer development bonus had been granted for providing that specified public facility. A case in point is Christie Avenue Park, which is to be expanded uh, as part of the public market project. Uh, because Christie Avenue Park is one of the projects that's covered by the park impact fee, they would like to get a park impact fee credit for designing and building, uh, redesigning and building that park. That's an open question at this point. It hasn't been decided if they're going to get a credit or not, but that's just an example that uh, of where this kind of thing would come up. And is this so new? Is it, is it or was it in? Um, it's. I don't recall yeah. reading something like this in the 200 page document. Which 200 page document? The one about the Nexus or Nexus report and all the details on this? Yeah, this isn't out of the Nexus study. Okay. This, this is, is the first time i have reading of a credit and a bit an availability of a type of credit. So when right. did that come into? Right now. Okay. 
So it is something new they've come up with. Well, yeah, it's not uncommon. I mean, it's something that uh, the only impact fee we have right now is the um, traffic impact fee. And those were mostly intersection reconfigurations. Mm -hmm. No, what I'm saying is when I read the whole 209 page report regarding these impact right. fees, this, I don't recall reading anything about this credit. You did not because okay. this is not a nexus study issue. Right. This is a policy issue. Mm -hmm. And so we're uh, putting it in the, in the ordinance as a, not policy regulation. Okay. But, what about but it's not automatic. They have to apply to the city council. The city council has to consider it and weigh the, weigh the arguments. They might or may not get their credit. Can well, I just finish? I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is a procedure for applicants to protest the imposition of any required impact fees through an administrative proceeding before me and thereafter before an independent hearing officer. Uh, and whoops, why did it? Oh, I touched the touchpad. Shame on me. Okay, anyway, so our recommendation is that you open a public hearing, take testimony about the proposed amendments, close the public hearing, consider the staff report and resolution, and then adopt the resolution approving the proposed amendments, presumably with the corrections that Commissioner Coomerly pointed out, and recommend the City Council adopt the ordinances. So that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any further questions you may have. What about, so in regards to the credits, um, what about mitigations that would that might be required under CEQA? Would, would you be able to double dip those? No. Okay. I, um, I kind of abbreviated those bullet points on the slide. They're a little more embellished in the staff report, and that itself is, is abbreviated from what's in the actual ordinance. But uh, just to, let's see, where is that? There's... Um, page seven on that. Thank you. Page four of the staff report. Oh, oh no, actually, that just that that only says you don't get it for uh, if you also got a bonus. But I you I don't you would not get credit for it either if it was a mitig required mitigation measure. So the way you'd really get that is say you're the marketplace the development is going to do the park and they're also going to do mini parks, parklets, and public plazas. So if they're not trying to get bonus points for those items, then those could um, be counted t as a credit towards the park fee? If those plazas, mini parks, whatever, are identified in the park fee as projects that will be funded by the park fee. And that uh -huh. basically is our parks and recreation strategic plan. So if you look at the parks that are identified in the park recreation strategic plan, that's what the park fee funds. If they want to put a plaza or something on the corner that's real nice, but it's not in the parks and rec strategic plan, they don't get any credit for that. So if you, so if, if you were going to build a park that the city was collecting money to build anyway, then you wouldn't have to pay the park impact fee. But you're really, really going to build that park. if it's within your development. You're not going to build something across town. Correct. The likelihood. It could be anywhere. Well, I think that's why Christie yes, Avenue Park is a good example, because that is in the Parks and Rec strategic plan. Right. And it is something that they will be doing. Now, one could argue, well, it's a requirement of the PUD, so you have to do it. Uh, so therefore, you shouldn't get credit for it. Um, and I'm sure those arguments will, will be weighed by the city council when they ask for their credit. So the one question I had that I want to interrupt you about is um, the uh, threshold for units the for going from 30 to 10 how was that number reached to reduce it from 30 to 10 do you want to respond to that Catherine <laughs> and if I could piggyback on that question what what is the threshold for local like for Berkeley or Oakland as well um, so that question actually came up when we were looking at the impact fee for rental housing and would there be a threshold for when somebody had to start paying the fee and uh, the ordinance does not have any threshold once you if for even one unit you would have to pay the fee because that one unit would create a need um, uh, in that discussions with the consultant and the attorney it was sort of pointed out that our threshold for you know as we are working through this ordinance that our threshold was actually quite high so I did some research um, there's actually a report done by Northern California um, the Northern California Nonprofit Housing Association of all the uh, inclusionary zoning ordinances in Northern California. And in fact, Emeryville's was the highest threshold. The average threshold was six units to start having to uh, provide 
inclusionary units. So we kind of looked at that and we said, well, let's, you know, we sort of weighed what we thought was an appropriate number and we came up with 10. And do we know so what still, Berkeley and Oakland require or start? Oakland charging? doesn't have inclusionary zoning mm -hmm. on residential, um, and I don't know what Berkeley's is. The port that I had that I got actually has each jurisdiction uh, enumerated, but um, yeah, some many jurisdictions it's five, and many jurisdictions it's ten, and many jurisdictions it's twenty. But I believe we are the only one that was at thirty. 30. My, so. my only point in bringing this up and concern, and since uh, Commissioner Tan isn't here, she and I were both quite concerned of small town developers making small projects of 12 units. This could be, I mean, you have the economy of scale when you're doing, you know, 100 units as opposed to when you're doing 12 units. Mm -hmm. And if a small developer, which we would like to see succeed and thrive, especially in Reveal, especially in our smaller lots on, say, San Pablo or something, um, this might be a financial burden for them to, to pay if they go to the highest recommendation of 20 or 25 that we're recommending. Well, there is actually, in, and there exists already in our ordinance, a way to um, uh, appeal and say that it's a financial burden. There is a process to show that it's a financial burden. Right, and in doing that, what's the likelihood that that is small time developer building 12 to 15 units is going to meet that? I mean, I think setting it at 10, personally for Emeryville is pretty low. Mm -hmm. And with, for the lots that we've identified that are small and would have potentials in small units, I think that could initially, you know, put a number of people out of play in developing those sites. So that's just my personal opinion. I think 10 is. I also want, I mean, we're trying to encourage ownership housing, and this could be a potential discouragement of well, producing it ownership. Well, it does apply to ownership housing. No, it does. No, it does. This is only ownership. Oh, yeah. no. We're changing the ordinance on the ownership inclusionary to oh, be I 10. See. Oh, 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 I see. Sorry. That's right. Yes, right. So this threshold doesn't uh, come into play for rental units? Rental units right now are subject to, uh, in under the ordinance are subject to the um, included uh, impact fee for any number of units. Right? For, for any, any number, number of units, units yeah. that's right. So it starts at, at one unit for rental. It starts at ten for ownership. Hmm. I have a question. The development impact fees are they? I mean, the, the way this is all worded, they're tied to specific projects. Is that a requirement that the development impact fees be tied to <coughs> specific projects or in housing? In what it, which yeah, uh, this was no in housing. It goes into a fund, and then okay. the way the fund is spent is is uh, is spelled out. <coughs> but but are like you saying that the fee is required to pay for specific projects? The park fee is required yeah, to pay or, for specific parks? I mean, parks. or there was some language about, it, you know, if the developer actually decided to take on that project, that improvement themselves, then it might be able to be, you know, it might reduce their impact fee. That's the credit. Yeah. And so I guess what I wonder, you know, <laughs> is if that one site is going to have a higher impact fee because it just happens to be located where... Um, where there's a lot of improvements that need to be made for no. anything, any development no. to be feasible? No. no. Okay. The, the state impact fee law says that you have to identify the projects that you're going to use the fee to pay for. Mm -hmm. So the nexus studies include the, those, well, except for the housing fee, which is a more general kind of a, a fee. It just it goes into the affordable housing fund, and that's it pays for affordable housing that way. But the park and the transportation fees pay for specific uh, park improvements and specific ped bike transit and auto improvements. So the, the, we had to identify what the projects are. And the amount of the fee that a particular development has to pay mm -hmm. doesn't have anything to do with where that development is located. The fees are based on units or square footage or rooms or whatever the, you know, whatever the unit is. Did we open the public hearing yet? I can't remember. Yep. Okay. We open the public uh, hearing. Anyone wish to speak? No one wishing to speak. We'll close the hearing and consider a motion to approve. The 
of modifications. I'll, I'll make a motion to um, adopt or to um, recommend approval of the ordinance with the um, modifications that Commissioner Coomerly mentioned. Second. We have a vote. All right, that was moved by Commissioner, uh, by Vice Chair Moss and seconded by Commissioner Donaldson. Commissioner Donaldson? Aye. Commissioner Gunkel? I'm still not sure about the threshold, so I, that's a nay for me. Okay. Um, Commissioner Keller? I'm gonna vote yes, just for, it's a general thing, but I agree with Commissioner Gunkel. I think the threshold is a problem, which is the case I'll probably make to City Council. Okay. Commissioner Coomerly? Aye. Um, let's see, Vice Chair Moss? Aye. And Chair Cardoza? Aye. So five ayes, one no. Motion is approved. We will forward your recommendation to the City Council. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Commissioner's comments. See none, we'll turn the meeting.